everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I know it's been uh, a back and forth uh, communication between Mark and I in trying to get me to uh, be here. Um, I was in the Czech Republic uh, most recently, and Mark was in Berlin, and then I was in Berlin, and Mark was someplace else, so we uh, really didn't get to connect. And in fact, I thought this program was going to be canceled since I didn't hear from Mark for a few days while I was traveling between Czech Republic, Paris, and uh, back to the United States. Um, I want to first um, say thank you to Mac for pursuing me for such a long time and getting me to be here. And I also want to acknowledge my Vice President for International Affairs from Morgan State University, who is here with us today, and we are actually hosting uh, 25 of the young African students at our university right now. And it's 25, right? 25 fellows, yes. Uh, but in addition, we are hosting about 300 students from Saudi Arabia and about 50. Dr. Robinson is actually the White House liaison this Brazil uh, initiative in which the Brazilians are looking to get about uh, 100,000 students to study uh, in the United States. I also uh, would like to take a minute to just um, thank uh, Nina for her wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, in fact, Nina made a lot of comments that uh, uh, reverberates with some of uh, my thinking. Uh, to give you a little background in terms of who I am, um, I'm originally from the Caribbean. I came to study at Morgan State University and went on to Columbia University where I did my uh, master's and PhD in international law. Um, I'm a two-time Fulbright professor. I spent a year teaching in Nigeria and a year in the Czech Republic. I have lectured about 75 universities around the world and the most recent engagement was in Canada, Jamaica, and uh, most recently, uh, Czech Republic. I believe in international education and believe in public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy in particular. The world is a very small place and it's getting increasingly smaller and smaller. It's also a very diverse place and I think Part of the difficulties we have had, not only in the United States, but in so many places around the world, is our inability to embrace the diversity of the world. It would be extremely boring if we all throughout the world spoke one language, had the same religion, had the same cultural traits, and ate the same food, the Herbert Marcuse one-dimensional man. We are seeing a drive towards that, but there's the negative and positive aspects of it, and I hope we could um, dwell more on the positive aspects of our commonalities instead of the differences. When Mark asked me to do this address and ask for suggestions in terms of topics uh, that would fit into his theme on uh, cultural diplomacy, I suggested uh, building the cultural divide, um, U.S. cultural diplomacy in the 21st century, multilateralism versus uh, unilateralism, or what some would refer to as American exceptionalism. And I want to believe, begin by prefacing uh, a statement President Obama made in his first inaugural address. And the president began by saying that the world has changed and we must change with it. I'm not sure the Congress, the vast majority of people in the United States, our policymakers in general, have given serious thought to this idea of the fact that the world has changed and we must change with it. There's still that conception, that belief in the United States that everyone wants to be like us. And I think it was particular during the debate on the healthcare, the affordable healthcare law, 
where some conservatives and those who were opposed to the healthcare law mimic the healthcare system in Canada and found someone who the Canadian government had sent to Utah to have a, a very complicated surgical procedure that would have cost a lot more to do it in Canada than to do it in the United States. But if you talk to anyone from Canada, or talk to anyone in the former East Bloc countries, or anyone in Western Europe, no one is willing to give up their health care, the current health care system they're living under, 41 in the United States. So there's a lot of cultural differences between us in the US and the rest of the world. And I think instead of trying to get everyone to be like us, we need to get to be like the others, as been echoed both by Nina and uh, the previous speaker. I also say to my students, one of the things I think is lacking in the United States, particularly amongst our leaders, is that we have no sense of anthropology, no sense of the differences um, of peoples around the world. Uh, we don't speak foreign languages. We don't appreciate the fact that people speak a different language. Um, uh, our curriculum is not geared towards making students more multicultural or more diverse in a global community that is increasingly integrated. And I've always maintained we should have a requirement in the United States that anyone who seeks to hold public office should take a course in anthropology or should serve in the Peace Corps. I believe if we were to do so, there would be a greater appreciation for the diversity, the cultural differences of peoples, and then we don't make the stupid, foolish mistakes that we made in Iraq made in Afghanistan, and more than likely will repeat in the near future. Military force is not solving anyone's problems. We could build up our military as much as we want. The people in South Korea, the people in China, in Brazil, are basically in waving us to continue, go right ahead, spend your money on the military, in the meanwhile, they're educating their population, they're expanding their, their economy, and they're competing with force on the world stage uh, as fiercely as possible. It is not surprising that South Korea, one of the poorest countries on earth, has one of the biggest economy, it's in the top 20s, and one of the biggest IT firms in the world is a South Korean company. Hello, this is a country that had nothing 50 years ago. And it's competing with the top American IT companies. So we need to think about it in terms of bridging this cultural divide and how we approach 21st century diplomacy if we are to be successful and remain at the helm. Um, I brought a prepared text, but I, I think it would be better to basically have a conversation. Um, and I, I want to begin by saying we live in a very, in a highly diverse world and a highly interdependent world as well. Um, borders are becoming increasingly porous and one state, regardless of its military might, is not able to address global problems on its own. Global problems do not know borders, they do not know culture, they do not understand power. Problems are problems, they affect every human being everywhere in the world. How we address it is not through unilateralism, but increasingly through, through global multilateral cooperation and respect for the rule of law. We can't have one set of rules for one group of countries and one set of rules for another group of countries. The Thucydides model 
of the strong make the rules that the weak has to follow is no longer a valid one for the problems confronting humankind. And let me say, 30, 40 years ago, the United States was the most dominant power in the world. We set the global rules, we set the global architecture for the post-Second War, the post -Second world war era. Um, we dictated the rules countries were supposed to follow. Today, it's a very different world. China is a major power. South Korea, of course, is a major economic power. Brazil, India, Russia, the European Union. The United States simply does not have the economic might or even the influence to make change or to dictate change in the world. And even the United States is not able to solve or address many of the global problems confronting mankind. This is not a world of 400 years ago where we sat in at Westphalia and hammer out a post-war 30-year order in which we created the sovereign state. Yes, the sovereign state has had many benefits to humankind. There are still people yearning to create their own sovereign state. But the relevance of the sovereign state is on the decline. Because the concept of the sovereign state itself is not dealing with, as Nina mentioned earlier, the thousands of children who are flooding to the United States borders, environmental problems, health problems, poverty, underdevelopment, weapons proliferation, terrorism. These are not military or security issues. These are religious, social, human issues, and they have to be addressed taking a, di a, a different approach and a different paradigm to international relations, okay? So let me say that the post-Westphalian world is one that is not viable in the international system today. Um, when states were the dominant actors several years ago, and states were the ones who had the monopoly over the use of force, Today, states no longer enjoy that monopoly. In fact, you have multinational companies, foundations, various individuals that are more powerful than many states in the international system. But the world is not only divided by states. The world is divided by people, by culture, by ethnicity, by geography, um, religion, but at the same time, we all recognize we occupy uh, the same common space in the global community. And as Nina mentioned in her lecture from the Russian participant, that we have a lot in common than the things that dif dif divide us. And if you look at the world today, whether it's in the United States or it's in South Korea or it's in South Africa, People are all looking for how governments can improve the human condition. Everyone wants a better standard of living. Everyone wants the freedom. Everyone wants opportunities. And if you cannot find it in South Africa, in Nigeria, you are going to seek it elsewhere. So it's not a question of addressing American issues or addressing Pakistani issues or issues in Burkina Faso, but they're global issues that requires global coordination. And that takes me to the American problem, whether the United States can continue to approach these issues or international relations from a unilateral or this model of American exceptionalism. We have not, since the end of the Cold War, articulated a foreign policy of the United States that embraces that diversity and the transformation of the world. 
We had a common enemy during the Cold War that no longer exists. We had a, an attack on the United States, not by a state actor, but by a non-state actor. And they did not use nuclear weapons to wreak the kind of havoc that was brought to bear on the United States on 9-11. In fact, that attack fundamentally redefined the relationship between the United States and its people, and the freedom that people knew the United States to enjoy, why people fled to come to the United States. So we need to take a very different approach and to avoid making the same mistakes that we've made in the past. When President Bush came to office in 2002 or 2001, President Bush unsigned the Rome Statute for the creation of an international criminal court. It is unprecedented in American diplomatic history that one president would sign a, a treaty and his successor would unsign the treaty. The treaty was not ratified but it was signed by President Clinton, and President Bush then unsigned the treaty. Consequently, we are not a party to the Rome Statute, and there is no indication that the United States will resign nor join the uh, International Criminal Court. However, we've realized that participate, joining or cooperating with the court in bringing to justice people who have committed the worst atrocities against innocent civilians in Sudan, in Uganda, in Democratic Republic of Congo, in, Lib in Libya, is the best thing to do. We cannot harbor international fugitives who have committed genocide, war crimes, or crimes against humanity. So on the short term, we may have thought not signing the treaty would be in the best interest of the United States, but the United States has subsequently realized, and particularly under President Obama and the last year of the Bush administration, that cooperating with the court and not vetoing resolutions in the Security Council that would allow the council to give the authority to the prosecutor to investigate and indict war criminals is in American interest and is the right thing to do. We signed the Kyoto Protocol and then we did not ratify the protocol. In fact, we've done everything since to undermine the commitments of the uh, Kyoto Treaty. Um, we have gone in a way more unilateral in trying to address some of the problems brought to bear by climate change. But even American cities and American states, in fact, the mayors, the conference of mayors meeting in Dallas, just adopted a resolution um, to address climate problems that the federal government, particularly the Congress, is so hostile to. Climate change is real, and one should have just looked at what happened uh, last year, year before, um, in New Jersey with the recent storm where, as a child, I never anticipated a hurricane hitting the eastern coast of the United States. So we are not immune in the United States from floods, from severe weather conditions, and particularly uh, hurricane. We did not sign the um, Ottawa Treaty banning landmines. And we are one of the major producers, so is, is Russia. And the technology is such that you could um, have adequate security um, without re, uh, relying on the use of landmines. Landmines kill innocent farmers, civilians, school children, even doctors who have volunteered to work um, in, in post-conflict uh, countries. In fact, I was in Angola a few years ago when seven or eight doctors from Medicine Sun Frontier were blown up in central Angola while they were doing voluntary work in uh, the villages trying to help uh, people. So this concept that 
we make the rules and others must follow, but the, Amer the United States should be exempted from it. It's not the right uh, policy or the right kind of diplomacy that is going to convince people to follow through. One of the other major blunders, which I mentioned at the beginning, is this unilateral invasion of Iraqi uh, territory in 2003. Again, if our leaders in the United States had either done, uh, taken a course in anthropology, or some of them had served in the Peace Corps, they would have realized that the use of force to um, dismantle the Hossein regime would have led to the kind of chaos we are seeing in Iraq today. Eight years ago, Vice President Biden, as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times saying that the best solution to, to Iraq is to break the country up into three. The Shiite South, the middle part Sunni, the northern part would be um, uh, Kurds. Well, it's a reality today that we propped up a regime that is basically uh, the strongest ally of Iran. And today, Iran, who we consider the bedfellow, we are looking to partner or at least cooperate with Iran in bringing down the uh, ISIS and Sunni uprising against an authoritarian regime in Baghdad. So the, uh, the problem is not the ISIS or the Sunni uprising. The problem is with the government that we help put in power that is a Shiite autocratic regime that has discriminated against other ethnic groups in Iraq. And given the lack of political space, not only in Iraq, but in so many other countries around the world, that people have no alternatives but to resort to military force to find solutions to their problems. And this is what we've yet to realize that when we fail to comply with the rules, it has certain consequences. And again, a very good example is the Russian in, uh, annexation of Crimea. We have no moral credibility to say to the Russians, you have violated international law when we did the very same thing in Iraq and got the Kosovo folks to declare themselves an independent country. What I have to say, I, again, if you just give me a minute, as I said, um, in fact, even sending advisors to Iraq, what are military advisors? I mean, we saw the same in Central America, military advisors to El Salvador and uh, uh, supporting the Contras. Um, those are very short-sighted issues. The long-term problem is whether we could bring about permanent solutions to problems that are not military problems. These are social, religious problems that go back thousands of years. And our failure to understand the root causes of these problems uh, by looking at it from a very narrow angle is what keeps us repeating the same errors. So we left Iraq, and I, I support President Obama's decision to leave Iraq. But going back, sending 300 advisors, may very well end up being a mission creep. Because if, they, if Iraq and the entire country is a theater of war, what are the rules of engagement uh, for the 300 advisors? Of course, in any agreement the United States government signs with a foreign country to deploy troops, and even the United Nations, the right to defend yourself against attack is written in that document. So what happens if ISIS or uh, some other element attack American advisors, whether when they accompany uh, Iraqi troops or uh, training Iraqi troops or whatever the case may be? But I also want to echo the fact that even as we saw in Ukraine and even in the situation in the South and East China Seas, a military option is not a solution. 
we, we would not attack Russia for annexing Ukraine because the stakes are too high. And similarly, in Asia, uh, the problems between China and the Philippines, China and South Korea, China and Japan, we do have a defense treaty with, with uh, Japan that requires the United States to come to the, the assistance of Japan. But we need to ask, is a military option something that we could put on the table? So diplomacy, and particularly for the students here, um, international relations and diplomacy requires a lot of patience. If you, are not, if you do not have the patience, do not go into this business because things take a long time to resolve. You do not get results overnight. So using the military option, assuming that you are getting a quick result from it, is just putting a band-aid on the wound. So again, we are seeing, whether it's in Afghanistan with the resurgence of the Taliban, or in Iraq with these various uh, groups, or the spillover problem in Syria, um, these issues are not going to go away. And voluntary organizations, which are, are very good. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was a two-time Fulbright scholar in Nigeria and in Czech Republic. I've traveled over 30 African countries. I've traveled all over Central Eastern Europe, uh, Central America, all part of a State Department public diplomacy project. Um, and keep in mind, before the end of the Cold War, we had an agency separate from the State Department called the United States Information Agency that provided the kinds of programs that are being addressed in a cultural diplomacy forum, whether it's a public speakers, it's educational exchange, it's sending American musicians, American artists, American, just name it, and these people would go overseas and perform. These create very different impressions of the United States than the official government-to-government -government, uh, policy. And people are surprised when the international visitors come to the United States and they're hosted by an American family, or similarly when we go abroad and hosted by foreign families. It makes a world of a difference. Now, I was at a music store in Berlin about two years ago, and this elderly man walked up to me and he said, do you like this artist? And I said, sure, he's one of the greatest jazz piano players. And he said, well, I saw him in 1957. So I said, oh, well, I have the CD, uh, you, it was recorded. And so he said, well, I was at the American Cultural Center at the time in Stuttgart, and they would bring all these jazz musicians, all the American magazines and newspapers, and that's how we got to learn about the United States. And we have this appreciation for American culture, American values, because of what the US Information Agency was able to do. After the Cold War, we have significantly cut back on all our public diplomacy programs and all our foreign exchange programs. In fact, as Nina mentioned, our foreign aid budget is 1%, our foreign relations budget is 1% of a huge federal budget. And foreign assistance, which includes all of these issues, is 0.16% of the budget. Norway, Denmark, Sweden, these countries contribute 10% of their gross domestic project, uh, product to international assistance. So we are way behind. It is not to say American private uh, philanthropic group American individuals are not filling that gap, but yet it is not a priority in our government to emphasize uh, the public diplomacy aspect of our diplomacy that would probably win the hearts and minds of people overseas. And this whole issue of terrorism. Well, if we take one definition to terrorism that suits us, and then for others, so if you say, if there's a bombing at a school in the United States and it's done by someone white or black, or it's not terrorism. 
But if it's done by somebody who is Muslim or somebody who is of Middle Eastern background, immediately we put a terrorist twist to it, right? Or if we support a rebel group abroad that is seeking to overthrow a government we don't like, then they are freedom fighters. And if somebody else is supporting a group that is an ally of ours, then they're terrorists. So if we take ISIS, for example, uh, not all ISIS or not all Hezbollah uh, activities are terrorist activities. So we have to differentiate, but it takes getting to understand the nuances about these various groups that are emerging on the scene that we don't know about. Because previously our enemy was the Soviet Union, and we geared much of our uh, resources towards bringing down that empire. But today, listen to some of the names, Zararistan, uh, um, uh, South Sudan, uh, some of the places where there are problems most Americans cannot identify on a map. So it, it takes a lot more, whether it's through our curriculums in the public schools, in universities, in high schools, to do the same as other countries are doing. When I teach in the Czech Republic, my average student speaks five languages. And I usually give them a, a geography quiz that I do in the United States, the first day of class. In the United States, I ask my students, what countries border the United States? And you would be shocked to see a, quite a, more than half the students could not tell you what countries border the United States. Jay Leno did the similar thing in his jaywalking in Los Angeles and asked a random pedestrian, hi, could you tell me what two countries border the United States? He hesitated for a minute and he said, Australia? And he couldn't say the other one. Now, you ask the same question to students abroad in some of the poorest countries and they'll be able to tell you. You ask them about American politics and American government and they could tell you. Okay? Because they make an effort to learn more about us than we learn you, uh, more. And again, I, I fully support the various public diplomatic um, initiatives of the United States. In fact, Secretary Rice, who uh, once she became Secretary of State, insisted on our diplomats spending more time in the countrysides, in the villages, than in the capitals of countries, was a good um, initiative, which was continued by Secretary Clinton, and I think Secretary Kerry as well. All these programs, whether it's the African Leadership Young African Program, the Senior African Leaders Program at the uh, African Center for Strategic Studies, the International Visitors Programs, the Fulbright Program, again, which is under severe budget constraints because they are now cutting back increasingly on the Fulbright Program. Um, there are a number of these various public diplomacy initiatives that could get uh, or need greater support to confront some of these uh, evils or the problems that we are talking about here today. As I, I began my presentation by emphasizing that these are global problems, not problems unique to any one country, and even when these problems are in one country, whether it's in China or the United States or Belarus or wherever, it requires global coordination. So the United States can solve it alone. We do not have the capacity to solve it alone anyway, even though we wanted to do so. And which is why I'm saying multilateralism as opposed to unilateralism or exceptionalism is a better um, model for the post-Cold uh, War and the post-Westphalian world uh, we need. But let me just conclude by saying that and Nina mentioned it very well again. We need to invest in our soft power. Our universities are the prides of many countries around the world. 
I think most people would want to come to the United States to go to university if they had that opportunity. The Harvards, the MIT, the Berkeley, the John Hopkins, the Columbia's, the Yale's, these are all schools people stay up late night studying hard to take the exam to see if they could get into an American university. Um, we could pride ourselves on the freedoms that we have in the United States, which again draws a lot of people to the country. Um, I've always maintained in any other country, in most countries you visit, politics is a zero-sum game. And it's a very adversarial um, endeavor. You do not see like we saw in President Obama and Secretary Clinton, where Secretary, uh, President Obama won the election, he invited his opponent to join his cabinet. Um, in, most, in most instances in the United States, when there's an election, the losing candidate uh, calls, makes a concession speech, congratulates the winner. This is not the case in many countries. In fact, if you lose the elections, you might as well leave the country because you may be killed or you'll never have any opportunities in that country. So we do have that model to show in as much as our politics can be quite contentious. Everyone say we are dysfunctional, we are divided. But when it comes to core issues, you see there is cooperation across the aisles. And particularly in American diplomacy, the, the founding fathers were very careful not to give any, not to concentrate foreign affairs power in one branch of the government. This is a unique situation. In England or in Canada, you have a parliamentary system. The prime minister has an automatic majority. He could get any measure through parliament unless they're backbenchers or those who uh, cross the aisles. But in the United States, the executive branch is independent of the legislative branch. The executive branch has its own foreign policy agenda and the legislative branch has its own, which is very short term and focused on winning the next election. So Tip O'Neill, our uh, famous uh, speaker of the House, once said all politics is local. Well, all politics is local, but all politics is also global. Because anything you do in the United States, whether it's the clothes you wear, the food you eat, um, the medicine you, you use, all of it has some international component. So it's no longer, as I said, this whole concept of a sovereign state of each country living in its own shell is simply not a model that will help us solve many of the global problems that we have today. So I want to emphasize, I am not anti-American. I love the United States. I am here because um, I have found joy in being here. I'm from the Virgin Islands, which is a colony of the United States. Or in fact, we are worse than a colony. We are a piece of national park because we fall under the Department of the Interior. Okay, but does that make me anti-American? No, because there are certain things you find in this country that you don't find elsewhere. But I'm gonna say the same I love the Czech Republic. I love Germany because it's so law abiding, it's so on time, everything works well. So there are many places that I love Mexico in as much as people put down Mexico and Mexicans because Mexico is a very beautiful country. It has everything one would want. But the people in Mexico or the people in Togo or Benin who don't take a course in international relations or in political science do not understand this concept of a border. If they were going back and forth for a thousand years, all of a, all of a sudden you say, well, the Rio Grande is the border of the United States, or the Bakasi region is the border of Nigeria and Cameroon, when families live across the borders. It doesn't register for these people and for the vast majority of people in the world. And as I said, whether you live in Nigeria or Togo or Ghana or Mexico, everyone is clamoring for the same thing. They want a better living condition. 
And if the international community can realize that, that it's not about sovereignty, it's about the global community and people, then we could make a difference. Thank you very much.